Awesome. All right. We are live right now. This is amazing. I, I promise you, if you would have told me that when I shot my shot yesterday and asked other coaches to retweet that I would be sitting here with you right now, I would have said, you're, you're crazy. You got, a, you got a lot of people to retweet it. So <laughs> I think you got a lot of people following him. So maybe this can be, uh, we can reach a lot of people. Yes, sir. So what we're doing is I am going ahead and emailing all the coaches so they can tune in. Um, I know it's a, if the coaches don't know who you are, I'm sorry. They've been living under a rock. I'm not going to ask not you not a problem. All, all of those things. But uh, my question is, okay, just starting off, you, you've talked to all these college coaches and everything. What are they doing to try to, because we, we should be in the middle of spring ball. Right. Like what are they doing right now to, to put in their offense or to get with their kids? And how do you think high school coaches can kind of modify that if they can at all? Yeah. I mean, most of them right now are just, are just installing stuff, do it via meetings like this. And so, you know, most of it's mental work and that's, you know, that's going to be the interesting thing is you always have different people that learn different ways. And so a lot of guys are going to be forced, you know, I look at the rookies that were just drafted in the NFL. They're going to be forced to learn much of this without getting into any physical reps. Um, and so again, there's some guys that can learn really well uh, off a of board and, and learning virtually. There's other guys that are rep guys and they need to run it over and over again. So that's kind of the fascinating part of it. But most teams that I've talked to, all they're doing at this point in time is just uh, meetings such as this, kind of trying to install and go through from a mental perspective what they would do in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's, it's kind of left to the players to, uh, to get a handle on it physically. Okay, so how's that going for them? Do you, you have insider knowledge. Is it going okay? Is it an adjustment? Or yeah, I mean, again, I think it's, I think it's like anything else. I mean, you know, I mean, especially in this day and age with the athletes, um, it's hard to lock them in for very long, um, you know. And so, um, you know, I've got a son that actually plays at Nebraska, and so they've been doing those kind of meetings as well. And so, I know at times he gets bored with it because he's been in the system, he understands the system really well mentally. And so as they go through this stuff, it's easy to kind of get lulled to sleep because you don't get to go out there and do it. You know, you don't get to go out and compete and run it. So, I mean, I think for the most part, it, it goes well. Um, but there's nothing like being able to look your player in the eye and take them out and walk them through what you're trying to do, see how they do it and make those corrections. So, um, so again, most coaches you talk to are like, we're doing something. So we're getting something out of this, but it's, it's nowhere close to what they would want to do. And I don't think they, they feel like it's going to be, you know, it can be nearly as effective as they need it to be with a lot of their guys that, uh, that need more time actually physically walking through or running through what they're trying to do. Okay. And do you see those coaches like simplifying their offense even further or their defense because they really don't know when they will see yeah. their players or do it, or are they just still throwing everything at them and like, this is um, what we do? You know, I think they're actually, and I know, you know, us, we just started our spring ball yesterday for high school. Um, you know, for me, uh, we don't get enough meeting time anyways. And so I try to use it as a means of going, let's, let's go through the little minutia of the offense, the little details that oftentimes we don't get a chance to, to really harp on on the field. And so I think that's how a lot of these teams are doing it. They're going back to square one. They're starting with the basics. They're trying to you know, throw a bunch of stuff on the board. And so these guys can hopefully grasp some of those nuances that they may not get when they go through it one time real quick, and then they have to go run it on the field. Um, so I think they're just trying to overkill the mental part of it in hopes that, uh, that that will pay bigger dividends or pay dividends, you know, come the fall when they actually get back on the field. Okay. Well, coaches, we, we, coaches are streaming in right now. It is so difficult looking at chat. They are all saying uh, you're a legend. Thank you for coming on. And just saying hello. Uh, coaches, if you want, put your questions in the chat. I'm going to do my best to find them because we got so many in there. But I want to circle back. You said you coach high school ball. Right. Uh, what, what, I'm, I'm guessing quarterbacks. Um, yeah. I mean, just offense in general. Uh, okay. But yeah, obviously, you know, my expertise is quarterbacks. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like anybody else to have their hands on the quarterbacks that I'm around. So, um, yes, I, I do coach the quarterbacks. Uh, started actually when my, my son, who's a wide receiver in Nebraska, uh, when he started playing high school ball, uh, I started coaching. So been offense coordinator, quarterback coach 
uh, for the most part. And then I've got a son who's 16 now that's uh, that's a quarterback. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, just heavily involved in offense and specifically passing game, um, you know, and then, you know, from OC to the quarterback coach and all that. All right. That's, that is awesome. Now, we talked before. I want to know how, as coaches, and your story is amazing about how you overcome adversity and everything like that. How can we help our players and coach that like grit factor? Because some of us, some of the kids don't have it and we struggle as coaches to try to teach that. We really don't know. Do you have any lessons for us that we can? You know, I mean, I, I think it's always a hard thing because, you know, the makeup of, of every kid is different. And I think that's what you realize, whether you're a leader in any kind of business, whether you're a coach, um, that you can't coach all the kids the same. And, you know, one technique for one kid uh, doesn't always apply to the next kid. And that becomes a, a hard part of the process is getting to know these kids um, and what pushes their buttons, what drives them, you know, what, what's the key factor in them, you know, uh, you getting them to want to be great or wanting to push themselves. Because I, I think ultimately when we talk about grit, um, it's about how passionate are you about something, right? The less passion you have for something, the less you're going to push through whatever, even if, Hey, I'm on the team, but that doesn't necessarily mean I want to be great at that. Or, you know, and again, we talk football, but that could be in anything in life. And so um, that's kind of what I've realized through the course of things as I coach different guys is I've got to get to know them and go, okay, how can I get them to, you know, to be what I think they can be? How can I push them so they want to work at something? They want to get better at something. They want to learn more. Um, and the unfortunate thing about high school, you know, again, I usually say fortunate or unfortunate, is that you realize not everybody that plays high school football wants to play in the NFL. Yeah. That's not everybody's experience. So even though I'm a coach and I want everybody, you know, to want that and I want to push them to be that there's sometimes I get kids and I know this is all they're ever going to play. They just want to come out here on Friday nights and they want to swing it around and they want to have a great time and they have a great experience. And I got to be okay to step back and go, if that's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. And then there's other kids that want all of it. And I've got to be able to tap into that and push them and find ways to help them get there uh, at the level that we're at. And so um, again, high school is a different beast. You get to college, right? Guys have chosen to be there and taken a scholarship and they want to play. You get to the NFL, you know, everybody has made it their profession. So it's different high school. Um, I just come to understand that, you know, you have 50 kids out there. They all could be out there for a different reason. Some of them just want to wear a Jersey on Friday nights, right? Because everybody's watching, you know, some of them want to, you know, play and be great in high school. Some of them want to move on. And so, that's one thing that I think you have to realize is what's their motivation, what's their passion level. And then once you realize that, and if you realize they're one of those kids that's passionate about it, how can you push them uh, to go beyond and go farther than, uh, than where they're at at that particular time? Okay. I, I like that you said that. So as coaches, I know you've been there too. How do you see a guy that has all the talent in the world? Like, you know, he could be really good, but he's not as passionate as that. And he just wants to be there with his friends. Mm -hmm. how do you step back as a coach and as a competitor and be like, okay, this is just what this guy wants. I just, and I just need to let him do that. How, how do you separate that? Cause I have. Well, yeah. I mean, you separate it to a degree, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to coach him to be the best player he can be in this moment. Even if it's not for him to move on to the next level, for him to have the best experience for him be to, to help his teammates. Cause I think that's always a key too, is that, when you got guys out there and you've joined a team, your goal is to be the best that you can be for this team, to help our team, to be accountable to that team. And so uh, I'm always going to push and I'm always going to coach with my passion and see if that passion carries over to them. But at the end of the day, I'm OK if a high school kid tells me, hey, coach, I love you coaching me. I, you know, I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to coach in the same way. But if they tell me. I don't really want to go on. You know, that's not really my passion. I'm going to go do something else. I have passions about other things. I can accept that, but that doesn't mean I'm going to coach them any less hard. It's not, doesn't mean my expectations for them is going to be any less than the next guy. It's just me having to understand. Yeah. He, he doesn't love it. Like 
I do, or he's not passionate or doesn't want to play it at the next level like I did. And I got to accept that because, uh, because again, high school is a different beast. And, you know, for me, I played every sport, right? I played baseball, I played basketball, I played football every year. Um, and I knew there were sports that I wasn't going to move on with. Right. And so I wasn't nearly as passionate about baseball as I was about football. So I was wanting to be out there because my guys were out there and it was fun and we, we battled and we competed. Um, but I was never in love with it to the point where I was going to stay after practice for two hours and, and hone every part of my craft. Cause it just wasn't what was in me. It wasn't where my passion was. So knowing that I went through that, I have to understand that with these other guys as well and maximize their time with me. Um, but not try to push them and, and force them to be something that they're not. Okay. That's, that's nice. And also I, I saw it on your Twitter account, you shoot those basketballs. Your form is, is nice, man. Well, that, was, nice. that was my first love. So had I been a little more athletic and maybe a little taller, I might've tried to go that route, but, um, but it's still something I do to this day is I, uh, I, I want to compete and it's hard to compete in football when you get to be my age. So uh, I play a lot of pickup basketball and uh, it's my way to stay competitive and stay in shape and, and, and uh, you know, and, and play the game a little bit. So form's pretty good. I was a, I was a pretty good yes. basketball player back yes. in the day. Yes, it was. I was like, goodness. My dad's a basketball coach. He's been, okay. he's a basketball coach for 30 years. So I, I'm like, man, he, you just, I mean, fellas, if you haven't go check out his Twitter account, it's, it's like a minute long where he's just shooting a three running, getting it running back and not even taking a breath like my out of shape self is. And just, I mean, he's splash after splash. Uh, I like that you said though, about competing. That's something that we kind of struggle. At. I'm just talking about from a personal level, me structuring practice and getting my kids to compete. Do you have any tips on how we can foster that competition and practice between players or anything? Uh, again, I, I think sometimes competitiveness is, is a built-in trait, right? You know, been around a lot of kids. Uh, some love to compete, some not as much. Um, but I, I would just say that, you know, one thing that I've always loved and I think makes practice more fun is developing competitive situations. You know, there, there'll be times with my quarterbacks when I'm working on a particular drill and, you know, I put the bucket up in the back of the, the end zone. And so we're going to throw a fade drill, but we're going to make a little competition. And, you know, and one thing that helps me too is obviously with my background, they love to beat me. So uh, yeah, I'll jump into competition and play with them. So, uh, so they get a little more fired up, but you know, I think anything you can do in practice that makes it more competitive, you know, I love, you know, doing drills where, you know, one of the high schools I was at, uh, you know, one day a week we would do, or every day of the week, we would pick a period where it was always competitive four plays at the goal line, uh, you know, third down and, and, and three, and, you know, we would pick three plays and, and we just keep tallies on it because, you know, kids love that. You know, they, they love to have something that's a little bit out of the ordinary and that you kind of keep score of, right. And then ultimately at the, at the end of the day, we might, you know, Hey, whoever wins this period doesn't have to, to run afterwards, or, you know, we're going to do something. So that's something we always try to do is we understand high school athletes. Again, a lot of kids there for different reasons. How can we kind of juice up that competitiveness when we know everybody isn't just self-motivated or, you know, self-competitive and, and want to compete at everything they do? How can we make it a little more competitive? And you see guys get locked in a little bit more when it means something, right? When they get yeah. something for it or the other team has to do something. So uh, that's one thing that I like to do is I like to make as many periods uh, somewhat competitive as we possibly can. Um, so it just breeds that. Um, and then again, you know, you got people talking back and forth and having fun with each other. And I think it builds relationships, but then sometimes you'll see kids gain competitiveness because, you know, their buddy was talking crap to them because, you know, they lost the other day. So now they come back out and like, I'm losing today. And you'll see the level of competitiveness amongst your team um, lift at another level, not because somebody wants to necessarily be great at football, but they want to beat their buddies on the other side of the line. Um, and that kind of stuff, I think, is, is ways to creatively, um, you know, get your guys to compete at different levels throughout practice. And I think learn how to compete uh, because a lot of kids are, are out there that maybe have never done it before. Okay. That's great. And you're right. When, when they compete, they start trash talking a little bit. And then I find that when we have done that, um, 
they look forward to practice, which is right. is, is what you kind of want with your players. Yeah, or, or at least they look forward to those periods, right? Yeah. And again, because you can't do that all the time, especially in our game now. We can't tackle and hit and do all of those things. So you try to, you know, put them in there. So every day they know something's coming, you know, something's going to be competitive and that's their chance to kind of go win the day, so to speak. Okay. Um, we've had a lot of coaches ask this type of question, so I'm just going to kind of summarize it. How do you watch film with your players where you take your knowledge because you, you know you've got a lot of football knowledge and kind of compress it for your high school kids so they can kind of dissect defenses and understand what you're looking for? Um, you know, it, it's that combination of trying to give them as much knowledge as possible, but also make it as simple as possible. And, you know, one of the things that I'm always trying to do with film is, again, I know those kids aren't going to grasp it like I have it. And so, you know, we have certain ways that we do things and teach things. So when I'm watching film with guys, I'm always trying to pick out coaching points that we have mm -hmm. and demonstrate why or why not that was successful on the tape. You know, because that's really what I want. As I, I know not every kid's going to study film and, you know, learn every coverage and know everything. But I want them to realize what we're coaching is vital to our success. And this is why. So a lot of the film that we're watching, it's pointing out, okay, see, so-and-so did this great right here and see how this affects the safety or how this makes the, the read easier on the quarterback and vice versa. Um, the other thing that I think is vital is, you know, I tell my, my players very early on that as coaches, we're always going to attack a problem. We're never attacking a person. And so I think that's extremely important that, you know, Johnny may be the point uh, of this problem that we have. But this is not about us not liking you or mad at you or, or you not. This is about solving the problem for our team. And so uh, when I watch film with them, that's something that we're always trying to point out, too, is that this is about us as a team. It's never about an individual. Um, and then coaches or I mean, I'm sorry, quarterbacks. Um, I'm always trying to push the limits with my quarterbacks. Uh, when I watch film with them, I'm trying to throw out every bit of knowledge that I have for these guys. And I'm trying to see how much they can grasp. I know they're not going to grasp at all, but the way I coach my guys is I want to see how far they can go. And I want to see how much information they can take in and how they can apply it to the field. And so with most guys, it's more simplistic. It's talking to the nuances. Hey, see how this works. See why this works. See what these guys are doing because we do this. But with my quarterbacks, um, I'm, I'm trying to give them everything I can possibly give them um, in hopes that some of it sticks. Um, and again, I'm a guy that always coaches to that level because you never know what a guy can handle um, until you push him. And so I am definitely a coach uh, that tries to maximize my guys and throw as much on them as possible, knowing if they can't handle it, I'll pull back. But I'm going to see what they can handle. I think too often we just assume, oh, they're high school kids. They can't handle it. You know, they can't do this. They're not smart enough. I never coach my kids that way. I always coach my kids like, I believe they can handle it. I believe they can do it. They put in a little extra work. It'll make us better. So I am going to push my guys to that level and then pull back when I have to on Friday nights when we're playing. Um, but I don't ever want to sell a kid short by assuming right off the bat Oh, they can't do that. They can't, you know, learn all of this. I don't ever want to do that to a kid. Okay. All right. That's, that's smart. And coach uh, Peterson says, attack the problem, not the person that's solid gold right there. Do you expect anything less from him? All right. <laughs> so uh, a lot of coaches want, they see the whiteboard. They want some plays. Could you walk us through what your, your offensive philosophy for the high school level is? Well, um, again, everything that you do, I think has to be, catered around your guys. Okay. You know, what do you do well and how do you play? Um, so the high schools that, that I've coached for, uh, we've never been very good up front. You know, we've, we have never been a team that can just turn around and hand it off and, and run for 300 yards a game and, uh, and win that way. And so, you know, most of the teams I've played on is, you know, it's really pass to set up the run, uh, try to get in the best situation as possible. And so, um, our offense is really designed, I kind of say, 10, 15 yards and down. Our goal nice. is to complete every pass and to gain five yards on every play 
um, and keep the chains moving. And we'll take our shots and we'll do that. Uh, but that's really our philosophy is a lot of high percentage throws. Um, you know, we're going to push our quarterbacks to read different things. So um, the way our offense is designed is we split the field in half and we call concepts on each side. So we can always marry and mesh concepts together. Um, you know, so it's not just, hey, everybody memorize one concept and it may limit us against certain coverages. We want to have the flexibility that if we know what coverage is coming, I can call a concept that's good for my quarterback on both sides and we have options. Uh, but it's really just designed to, um, to get completions and to move the ball. Uh, just because I, one of the things I believe, and again, based on the teams I've been with, a negative play, there's nothing worse than a negative play in high school. So if we get, you know, if we even have a run play and we lose two yards and we're, we got to get 12 yards. So again, I told you, my goal is five yards a play. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in second and 12, I don't like those odds for us where I got to drop back and hold the football, um, you know, where I've got to take a shot down the field, a holding penalty, those things kill us. So my philosophy is ball out of hands, get into your playmaker's hands, make the defense tackle you, right? Get out in space and make somebody tackle you. Um, and then we're trying to get first downs and, and picking our moments to take shots. Okay. So what would a, a day one install look like for you? Day one install. Okay. I mean, I, again, we, we could go as far as we want to go. So I'll just start with just some of our basics. Okay. okay. So. All right. So our concepts are always built to be able to run two man concepts or three man concepts. And so we can do either one and we try to make it again, as simple as possible. So just for instance, we'll start with our two receivers. And again, in high school, I'm always trying to make it as simple as I can for my, uh, for my players. And so we simply call, we simply call this play hitch. And so what I'm trying to do is eliminate as much thinking as possible. So hitch and most of our concepts are called in such a way that we're, we're telling the outside guy what he's doing. Okay. So our outside guys just run a hitch. Okay. So it's just day one install. We got, we got our quicks. Okay. Um, okay. So what does that mean for our inside guy? A lot of our uh, quick game, we marry, we mesh, uh, you know, both concepts. So when we say hitch, basically both teams run a hitch. Okay. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, both players run a hitch. And so, but here's where the nuances come into it. And again, just to me, teaching and understanding the why of what you do becomes so vital. So what we do on our hitches here is we, what we call a burst release. And so again, we could go into all kinds of philosophy. I could talk for a long time, but I never have my receivers ever straight vertical release. We are either releasing inside or releasing outside. We're trying to create movement. I believe that uh, the key to forcing defenses to play or getting your quarterback a bigger read, a better read, a quicker read, is to create movement. I want the defense to move. If the defense stays in the same place, we haven't won. If we get them to move, that gives us a benefit when we're playing the game. So we are going to always inside or outside release. So here we're going to outside release and, and run basically double hitches here. Okay. So why do we do that? What, what's the emphasis on, on why we do that? Okay. So here's the thing. I always break down uh, our plays to our quarterbacks on what plays do we like or what coverage do we like this play against? And so I'll break it down different ways. Sometimes it's based on specific coverages. We like this against this coverage, this coverage, this coverage. Other times we'll break it off into I like this concept. So we like the hitch concept against any corner off coverage. Okay. So that could be four, that could be three, uh, be cover one, whatever it is, but specifically any corner off coverage. Okay. So I know in any corner off coverage um, that I am going to only have, I'm going to have one linebacker under here that has to cover from the hook area to the flat area. All right. So again, I'm always trying to simplify it. quarterbacks. This is what you're seeing. Once corners off, we want you to read that guy right there. Okay. We're, we're going to make it hard on him um, because we're going to make one guy cover two. That to me is good football, right? If I'm attacking a zone, 
I got to overload the zone. Okay. So here's what we got. Okay. We're going to outside release here for two reasons. First reason we're outside releasing here. Okay. We're going to outside release and push vertical. So knowing we're going to try to read this or hit this outside in, all right, as we get outside. So we're going to be forced the outside release on this guy and we push up. We're going to create a little bit of interference here. That's the first part of it. If I create anything that causes this guy to slow down while that corner's off, this is an easy pitch and catch out here for this guy. All right. So that's the first reason that we do it. Second reason. Okay. We already said, okay, this is the guy that we're reading off of. Okay. Worst case scenario, we're, we're, we're seeing a cover three. Okay. So we have two defenders to this side. This is the worst case scenario with corner off is two defenders to this side. Okay. So as we widen and this guy buzzes to take that away, the next thing that we're doing is we're creating width from this guy. So if this guy takes away the outside one, we're trying to get inside. So we created width to create a bigger window. So hopefully our quarterback can throw to that side and we can beat the Mike backer with the throw. All right. So that's, that's where it all starts. Okay. For you young coaches out there, I am a huge component of checkdowns. Checkdowns to me are vital in pass concepts and understanding why. Okay. Why do we do this? What do we like this play against? And how does that play into where I want to put my check down? So as I said, corner off coverage. Okay. Corner off coverage. Anytime there's a corner off, the worst case scenario for me to this side is, as I just said, there are two defenders down to that side. Okay. So if there's two defenders down to that side, what I would like to do is I want to have three guys to there too. So I am going to put my check down to that side. So worst case scenario, this guy buzzes and takes that away. This guy takes that away. We've got them overloaded to that side. So it's just simple football one-on-one, right? I understand why I'm calling a play, what I'm trying to get on a particular play, and knowing what I'm trying to get and that corner's off, this is my worst case scenario. So I am going to overload the worst case scenario. So my quarterback has an option every time he does it. Okay. So where am I? All right. Right. Uh, so you're having that, is it the slots always releasing outside or inside? Or do you give that to both wide receivers? No, just the, just the inside guy. Okay, and are you giving him the freedom to release inside or outside, or no. is his release based on no. what? It's okay. based on what the concept is. Okay. And so we, we we build in some cheats for our guys to help them know when it's inside and when out when it's outside. But no, it, it it all correlates to what we're trying to do, what the goal of the play is. And so again, this is an outside release because I know what I'm attacking here, and I know that I'm trying to to win off of this guy, help myself here. And then went off of this guy if it's a worst case scenario. So by the same token, if we did this play out of a three by one, okay, what we do is we're going to do the same thing here, obviously. So that's going to look the same. And we're going to add our third guy running what we just call a pop route. So as you notice, doesn't matter if it's the T or it's the number three in our mix, we still know that this is worst case scenario. So worst case scenario, once again, I've got them overloaded three on two if I'm going to this side. Anytime this corner gets in the mix and they've got three on three, we're gonna have something on the other side that should be able to attack that. So that's to us like day one install. And again, it's more about the nuances and how we run it. This isn't a special play. Everybody runs something similar, right? It's not rocket science but the little nuances of why you do things and how you do it uh, can be vital because plays need to be designed and thought through as in, why am I calling this play? What am I calling this play against? What am I trying to throw? And more importantly, what can stop me from being successful here? Let me answer that questions for my quarterback. So in essence, there's really nothing that can stop this as long as my quarterback understands we've got corner off. Okay. I, I love how you teach the why. And I find that teaching kids whys now, like the whys that they will do it. It's We've gone from just do this because I'm the coach to just do this because this is why I want to do it. Yeah. Um, do you, 
do you give the quarterback, let's say you call that and they're in man or something like that. And you said you have split field. Do you have like a man beater on one side and a zone beater, or do you give the quarterback the option that if neither one are there, he can check out of it? No, I mean, I, I try to avoid that as much as possible. I mean, the beautiful okay. thing about high school is that, um, you know, most teams don't play four different coverages. You know, most teams are playing two different coverages, you know, at the most. And so what I'm always trying to do is if I'm not sure what the team's going to do, I'm trying to give my quarterback an answer um, for, you know, whatever I expect the defense, you know, to do or whatever the possibilities are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so I'll give them something on the other side that attacks those things. So corner roll down here. And I don't, I know I don't like this play against corner roll. So I'm going to have something on the other side that will attack what coverage we might see where the corner rolls to that side. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to teach my quarterbacks to read the defense to see the defense, to understand the nuances. So simply understand if the corner's off or not. If that corner's not off, now I want you to go away from it. it, it it's as simple as that. And so um, trying to simplify it, but also trying to give them options so they have a chance to be successful on every play if we do it right or uh, you know if he reads it right. Okay. Um, do those concepts change week to week based on what your defense or the, the opponent does, or is it always when wild run hitches, I have this other concept on the backside always? No, those will always change. So, okay. you know, and then again, that's, what, that's the reason why we split the field in half. So it doesn't always have to be like, for instance, a lot of teams might just tag that. And let's just say they go, you know, trips left and they call it hitch. And so something is built in on the backside on the hitch play you know, or they use a team name or whatever it is. And so the backside is always built in. I'm not a fan of that because there might be a team that plays a particular coverage that now limits, you know, takes away what you have on the backside. So I always want to have the ability to change what we do on one side or the other. Um, so yeah, that's, it's never built in. We don't have any plays that are necessarily designed where we call one term and everybody on the field knows what they're doing. Um, we're going to split that up. And so all you got to know is, what side am I on and what receiver am I? Uh, and that helps you to know what you're running and, and how you're running it. Okay. So does that make your play calls wordy to an extent or is it? I mean, yeah, it can. I okay. mean, obviously we're going to always call two words instead of one. Gotcha. You know, so instead of something, you know, being Miami, you know, we might have to call it Miami Dolphins. And so, um, I that. yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to make it a little wordier. Um, and that, you know, becomes another part of the entire process as well. Like, where's the strength of your football team? You know, the fortunate thing for me is the strength of most of my teams have been the quarterback. Mm. And so I'm going to lay more on the quarterback to call more in the huddle and tell more guys what to do. But that to me is easier than expecting four wide receivers to always know what Miami is. And then if I want to flip Miami, so now the Z is running with the X runs. Now, what do I call that? And now everybody's got to flip that in their minds. I'd rather just say, at the end of the day, it's going to be easier because I'm going to be able to make one call that they know, and I'll be able to flip the terms on my own and switch what I want to do and attack differently. So I think it's six of one, half dozen of the other, gotcha. but a lot of it plays to what's the strength of your team? You know, what, what can you handle? Um, but when your quarterback is your strength, I'd rather him tell everybody what to do so everybody knows as opposed to let's just throw it up on the board and let's hope everybody gets it right. So it can make us uh, a little more wordy than different people. Um, but I think more importantly, it helps my quarterback to know, Hey, I just told everybody what to do. I feel pretty good. They're going to be in the right spot. And now we have a chance to be successful that way. Okay. Uh, a lot of coaches in the chat want to know what is like your install schedule look like, like how many days, how many concepts, things of yeah. that nature. Um, you know, uh, uh, usually what we do, um, with our guys and a lot of it depends on, do we have a veteran laden team? Do we have guys that have been in the system? Do we have a lot of new guys? Um, but you know, usually what we do is, you know, I always try to, to tie concepts together. And so, um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, to think of, you know, different things, but so, um, let's just say for instance, you know, we just ran that, that hitch concept, okay, is a play that I'm sure everybody 
runs as well. But you know what what people used to call the old hit, uh, smash concept. So just a hitch on the outside, and then a corner on the inside. So like when we go to install, you know, we will usually do two or three quicks. Like early in, you know, we only have a number of quicks, but we'll do two or three quicks uh, and two or three regular passes on an install day. So we don't, again, overload them, um, but we're also trying to push them. Uh, you know, I want to try to, I would rather try to get all of our offense in quickly and then go back and reinstall it or go back and talk nuances, then go real slow with the install and, and stretch it out. I'd rather give it to them, see what they do with it, see how much they can handle, see who goes home and studies, and then we'll work from there. But so for instance, we'll call the hitch concept, which as you remember, outside release, push up, run a hitch, and we'll put it together with our smash concept. Oh. So now as they're learning it, they realize, oh man, you know, these, these two concepts marry to five yards. Now I'm pushing up and now I learn the corner part that goes off of it. But trying to conceptually put plays together um, that could help them learn. So, you know, one day their release patterns or whatever, you know, we're connecting them together. That is brilliant. And that so you know, brilliant. that's again, just trying to make it as simple as possible, but that muscle memory, um, you know, they can learn from that. And then they can, more importantly than me, like you said, the why now they can start to connect. Oh, this goes with this. This is the complement to that. Oh, we have run this exactly the same. So up until 10 yards, it looks exactly the same as what I did on all these other routes. And they start to realize it's much simpler then sometimes it can seem when you're starting to throw a whole bunch of stuff on the board and they're like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of concepts. Yeah, but we're giving you a cheat and you're basically doing the exact same thing to this point. Now you just got to know where it goes from there. I like that because you, you've told them the while on the hitches, hey, call this when the corner's off. So that slot guy's still in, outside releasing and sitting down. And now you can go, okay, now if that corner comes down, then we're going to call the smash and the slot sees the then they see you are teaching the if then method that is brilliant you no know, right i mean of course it's like you know I'm, I'm just a firm believer that every play needs to have at least one complementary play and so we understand what we're doing and if a defense does something we've got an answer to that um and so but again you know a lot of it is just i want you to see how we're making everything look the same to the defense right? The defense has no idea because 10 of our plays look exactly like that up until five or 10 yards. So now the defense has no idea what we're doing to them. And, you know, we're just, we're running the same stuff. You know, you don't have to learn a whole lot. You're going in, you're going out, you're running, you know, a corner, you run a post, whatever it is, but we're trying to make the defense go, man, this looks just like the last play. This looks like, oh, the other play. Now I don't really know what we're doing. And, you know, you do that with three or four plays and you don't have to overwhelm guys, but you have compliments to, to attack anything that a defense does. Okay. I love that. All right. So talk about the install. Now, how do you structure practice so that the kids get it? Like, cause a lot of coaches are wondering how you structure the practice to make sure you hit all these little nuances and everything in that limited yeah. time frame that we have in high school. You're right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough um, again, cause we're always limited in high school. But, you know, the way we like to do it, if we have the ability now, we, because we are in Arizona uh, and it's already a hundred degrees here, um, we actually practice in the mornings. And so, you know, the hardest thing for us is we don't really get a meeting before practice. And so we don't get a chance to install something on a board and then take it to the field. So a lot of times we got to do our meetings the day before, or we got to send stuff out to our guys and hope they learn mentally. But you know, we structure practice where the first thing we do in the morning is install. And so, you know, whether it's a weekly game plan or whether it's, um, you know, whether it's, it's day one install, we have a walkthrough, an install walkthrough in which we, we walk through those little nuances. And so whatever we're doing there, we'll have our coaches, you know, hit on some of those nuances. If, you know, if we're talking to the offensive line, we'll get our receiver coach to kind of talk you know, conceptually to those guys on the outside, but we're always going to do a walkthrough install. So we're not just running through it. Um, that's the first thing we do. Um, the next thing we do is, you know, whether it's usually routes versus air. So if we're talking with our receivers, 
you know, then we're just going to, we're going to harp on, you know, whatever that concept is or whatever that nuance is that we need uh, to work on. We are going to run through those, you know, those concepts that fit together um, and get them starting to realize what it looks like um, our quarterbacks throwing it. And then oftentimes when, um, you know, when we're in special teams is when I'm going over with the quarterbacks and now I'm talking them through the reads and I'll be out there and we'll put our quarterbacks out there, whoever, and I'll give them a read as we're going through this. So now they're mentally and physically putting it together that way. Um, you know, and then, and then it just goes into our seven on seven and team, um, you know, that way, but, you know, oftentimes we're trying to, um, especially early on, we're focusing on those concepts that we just put in. And so we're trying to give them and overload them with reps um, on those little nuances. So on a particular day, we'll emphasize three or four concepts that we really like. So these guys are running it. All the different guys are getting it. The quarterbacks are getting a number of different reads on it. Um, so again, you know, as much can stick as possible. Okay. And I heard you say that you you huddle up and you have the quarterback tell everybody to play. Are you are y'all a huddle team? Because I know, especially yeah, now in are. high school, it's okay. Why? Yeah, we're, we're, I'm we're curious. Working, well, um, again, because again, a lot of it I think plays to your strengths. Uh -huh. and so you know, what are your strengths? You know, our strengths, as I said, is not necessarily our offensive line. So a big thing that that we do, we do a lot of um, you know formations and motions. So a lot of our wins come off of formations and motions. And so, you know, just it's harder to do that with no huddle. Uh, it creates a lot more verbiage to do it with a no huddle. Um, but we want to have that capability too. Um, but here's the, the, the hardest thing for me is, is I've never really figured out the best way. I, I'd like to just be able to call one term mm -hmm. and everybody know what to do. And I just haven't been able to figure out how to do that at the high school level. Um, cause there's you know, too many parts that you have to tell people where to go. And again, because I'm a huge check down guy, that's kind of the biggest thing that plays into it is it's hard to come up with play calls that attach to all our different protections or more importantly, where our back goes on his check down. And so, um, so it just, I've never felt comfortable with being able to run our offense the way we run it and to keep it simple enough that the kids can play fast without thinking. Um, so we've got some thoughts this year. We're going to try to be a little more, uh, have the ability to do a little more up tempo, no huddle. And we've, and, and, you know, and my teams have done that before. Um, but again, it just hasn't played to our strengths. We aren't just flat out better than the teams around us where we don't have to get complicated and we can just, we can just win that way by, by making them simple. A lot of times we got to out scheme people, um, and create opportunities for ourselves. And it's just a lot harder to do that in a no huddle setting or a up tempo setting than it is uh, coming from the huddle and, and having the, the variety of things that we like to do. Okay. And JT O'Sullivan is in here and he says the check down is a unicorn at the high school level. And I agree, but I have a difficult time teaching my kid, hey, when you're in trouble, just find the running back. What, what are some tips that I can give my quarterback to get well, to the check down? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's always a hard thing. Um, you know, because again, you know, how much can you process? How quickly can you process it? Um, but I would say more than, than, than we throw an actual check down, we use our back as part of the concept. And so that's where, to me, the check down doesn't become a unicorn. Um, you know, as JT said, <laughs> we actually talked about it. You know, so if, if you're just saying, here's our play out here, and then your check down's in front of you, that's really hard for a quarterback because – they're thinking conceptually, conceptually, conceptually. Oh, shoot, everything fell apart. Oh, get to this guy that has no correlation to anything and throw it to him. Mm -hmm. The way I think of checkdowns is my checkdowns connect to the concepts. Okay. So if they're reading to the left side, my back is part of that, that concept. So if, if you don't have the other throw, throw it to your back. And so we get a lot of completions. And, you know, my backs have been some of my better players over the years. And so I'll have backs that catch 50 balls in high school because we wow. make them a part of the concept as opposed to just making them a, a quote unquote check down. But just like I said, on the double hitch, that check down becomes vital because once again, he's a part of the concept. You're going outside backer to inside backer 
and the check down's right in front of you. So we make it part of his progression as opposed to, hey, your check down's over there somewhere. <laughs> Read to the left and then go back and find this guy. We, we don't do a lot of that. And so uh, that's why I believe, you know, calling plays and understanding why you're using a check down and how you're using a check down is extremely important. Otherwise, he just becomes a guy off the map somewhere. And as JT said, it, it's hard to get a quarterback to, to go, hey, read this whole concept over here and then just find that guy that's over there somewhere that has no correlation to anything. And, um, and so you're right. I mean, quarterbacks at that level don't process fast enough. You know, don't think check downs. They think big plays, get the throw in front of me, or then run around and, and, and do something with it. And so um, that to me is where it's different. I don't just randomly throw my back somewhere and just go, oh, just go find your check down. I, I don't do that. I, there, there, there's a method and a madness to it. Um, and I try to make it correlate visually or read wise with my quarterback. So it becomes an essential part of our plays and it becomes much easier for them to, to get there. Okay. Is, is the love you have for the check down come from your playing days in the NFL is, and then you realize as a quarter, as a high school coach, Hey, this is underutilized or is this something you just. Well, yeah, I mean, on? yeah. I think it's a couple things. I mean, I think first and foremost, it's, it's about play design. You know, it's, it's about putting your quarterback or your team in the best position to win. Um, and that guy can be vital in overloading a defense. And so I think that's the first part of it. The second part of it is in high school, that's usually one of your best players is your running back. And so to waste him on every pass play by just throwing him on a random check down or having him block in a six man scheme when he doesn't block most of the time, because nobody's bringing pressure, uh, it's a waste. And so what I realized in high school is I would rather my quarterback throw the ball four yards to my best player out in space and make them tackle him than my you know, quarterbacks drop back seven yards and throw a ball 45 yards and try to hold the ball and hope we can get it off. And so I think it becomes, you know, combination of things is it's, it's conceptually part of what we do to force a defense uh, to not be able to stop us. And then beyond that, it's, it's, it correlates to who my players are and what I think the hardest thing in high school football is get a good player out in space and get and tackle them. Yeah. Right. I mean, that to me is, is harder, um, you know, on a defense than us just dropping back and winging the ball 50 yards down the field and hoping that we're accurate or the guy catches it or, or whatever. I'll just give it to my best player and, uh, and you got to tackle him all night long and then we'll hit our compliments behind that when we need to. Yeah, get it to your best player and let him do what he does best. Okay, a um, couple of questions. Are you a wristband, uh, a signal? How do, how do you get the play – in. We, we primarily signal, um, okay. but I've been a wristband guy too. And, and again, because of, um, you know, some of the nuances that we like to add and some of the wordiness of some of our plays, I've done the, the wristband before, especially in, in, in critical situations. So I may not do it, you know, the, the whole time. Um, you know, what I've done with the wristband before is, you know, we'll script up first 15 or first 20. Um, and so because I already know what, the, what I want those plays to be and stuff, just makes it easier on our quarterback just to go number two. Um, and then like third down situations, third and short situations. So it just rolls off their, their tongue and we can just roll with it. Red zone situations or specials that we may have that are a little different or maybe a little longer in a call. Um, so I've done both and um, you know, and, and I played with both. And so I think, you know, a wristband can make it easier to call I think it makes it harder to process because when you just read, just because when you're reading, when you're reading plays off the, so a couple things, you know, first thing is when somebody sends a play in with a signal, that's my first time that I'm hearing the play. Okay. So I, I'm taking it all in and I'm visualizing what that is. Then when I have to remember it and call it, that's my second chance to visualize the play and see what's going on. So when I'm walking up to the line of scrimmage, I basically already got two mental reps or two visuals of that play. When somebody just throws in a number 12, first of all, I have no visualization the first time. And then when you give them words on a page, oftentimes they're just reading words on a page. You know, the smart ones obviously 
can slow it down in their mind and read it and visualize it why they're doing it. But oftentimes it's just trips right, double hip. And they haven't even thought about it. And now they're walking up to the line of scrimmage. And it's really the first time they've slowed down to the point where they're visualizing what's going on and they can think it through. So, uh, so again, there's six and one half dozen to the other. There's benefits, pros and cons to each. Um, but to me, it's about, I want my quarterback really knowing what we're doing. And so, excuse me, the best way to do that is the way I want to do it. So sometimes it could be, you know, on the wristband because I want them to have more time to, to, to think through a new concept. And then there's other times that I like signaling it is because they got to think about it and now they're ready to go and they're ready to, you know, handle it because they've, you know, put that in their mind already. Okay. Do you know when you're going to do that during a game or is it kind of like a feel like when you're going to signal through wristband? Um, what you, what normally happens because, you know, the problem with, um, and again, because of our offense is different, uh -huh. you know, because our offense is we call conceptually, you know, I can't put down every conceptual concept that I'm, that I want to run, you know, like, cause I don't know what we're going to see and what the team's going to do. So I can't put a thousand plays on there based on, Hey, what if we want this concept with that concept and then this concept. So I can't do that. So what normally happens is, you know, I normally find myself just calling it off the top of my head based on what I'm seeing. And so we get away from the wristband, but again, there's always specials that we have that maybe we've only run a couple times that week. You know, we put in a special, you know, deep play or special reverse or something like that. And then I'll lean on those plays or the other thing I do with my wristbands is I always, you know, when I'm doing that stuff is I'm always walking through with my quarterback throughout the week. What's your favorite third down, you know, what's your favorite red zone play. And so sometimes I'll be able to, I'll, I'll use it then instead of creating my own or going off my head, I'll go, I, oh, I know, you know, I know my guy really likes this one, you know, let's go, you know, number 33, because I know it's one of his favorite plays and we'll, we'll go back to the, to the wristband, um, you know, based on certain concepts or certain specials that, that we've put in that week. Okay. I love that. All right. I have to say this, JT said, Kurt is impressive on so many levels, best story in football history. Very cool that he keeps sharing, especially with high candor and thoughtful insights. This is awesome. So I just wanted to, to relay that Thanks, to JT, you. JT, appreciate it, man. Um, I like that you put a lot of things on the quarterback because you said that's, that's your strength. And so he has to be a leader. Do you do certain things to help him build that leader mentality or capability? Or is it just like he kind of like born with it? Or, or um, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, you know, I think you, you know, when you know a guy's got to be a leader on your team, mm -hmm. you try to help facilitate that where you can. Um, but I like it to be as natural. or I like it to be as much on them as it possibly can be. I'm a, I'm a believer that, Leadership is about authenticity. It's not about a certain way. It's not about, um, you know, a certain formula to become a leader. To me, leadership is about respect. And you've got to find a way to earn the respect of your teammates if you want to lead them. If you can't ever earn their respect. Yeah, they might follow you because of your position, uh, but they're not following you because of who you are. So I don't ever try to tell anybody to be inauthentic and, you know, do something, Hey, you gotta, you gotta yell and scream at them. You know, you, I want them to be them and I want them to build relationships and earn respect. And there's lots of ways to earn respect, whether it's hard work, whether it's knowledge, whether it's putting your arm around them when they mess up, sometimes it's getting in their face and, and holding them accountable. Um, but I want that to be as authentic as possible, but there are definitely times when I'll pull my quarterback to the side and go, Hey, you know, I saw you do this. Now you need to go do that, you know, or, Hey, this would be a great opportunity. And again, it's on you. You don't, I'm not forcing you to do anything, but this is a great opportunity for you to go love on your offensive line a little bit, or go lift up your defensive players that you don't ever think about, um, you know, those kinds of things. So I'll always give them little pointers, pointers along the way. Um, and then there's other times that I'll, I'll lead to that leadership, you know, that a guy might not be vocal and I'll go into a, a meeting room and I'll point out something great that one of my leaders did, um, you know, and make a big point of it, um, you know, to, to just let everybody know that there's certain things going on that you might not see. And that specifically talks to a quarterback, because I think it's so easy for us to notice what a quarterback does wrong. You know, it's so easy for everyone to see, oh, my gosh, and, and to, to blame or I was wide open or whatever. And so I'm very cautious of protecting my quarterbacks and going into the room and going, hey, Here's what he saw. 
hey, guys, understand, this is all the stuff he's got to handle on this particular play. It's not easy. Yeah, it wasn't a great decision here, but there's a lot of stuff going on here, and this is why this partic- particular thing happened. And so, you know, I think that that stuff is important. Um, and I also think it's important to hold your guys accountable, hold your leaders accountable. You know, I never want to be a coach either that that protects my leaders to the point where everybody thinks they're getting special treatment or they, you know, think that, oh, he's my best player. So he doesn't get, um, you know, he doesn't get criticized or, or pointed out. And as I said before, I'm always going to use the theory. We're going to attack a problem, not a person. So we will attack anybody, no matter how successful they are, no matter how good they are for us. If there's a problem with what was accomplished or what we did on the football field, we are going to point that out and we're going to love on our guys and we're going to let them know it's, Hey, and we're pointing this out because you're our best player and we need you to do the right thing. And we expect you to do the right thing. And it is what it is because we've all made mistakes. And, you know, and and the good thing too, for me as a quarterback is I'm always going to bring into play, um, you know, the struggles I've had, right? I mean, I've never played the perfect game. You know, I had games where I threw five interceptions, threw the longest interception in, uh, in Super Bowl history. There was a turn for a touchdown. I've got plenty of blemishes. And so I think it's important, too, to make yourself human and to make them see and understand, um, you know, that, that you've been there and you've done it and you've made the mistakes, uh, even though you've played at the highest level and played really well. Um, you know, we're all in this together. And so I think it's important to, uh, to show a little humility and point out some things. Uh, sometimes send videos of yourself, you know, doing stupid stuff. Um, it just endears you. And again, it earns respect because you're not afraid to go, hey, I can point out your mistake, but I'll also show you when I did that or why I didn't. And so I think that balance is always important for building relationships and, you know, helping your leaders be leaders, um, you know, but also coaching them. So, uh, you know, you're not sitting back, not getting better because your best player isn't getting coached like everybody else. I like that. I like how a lot of coaches that I've been around, I'm just speaking personal uh, experience. They will tell their story, but they'll tell all the highlights. <laughs> sure. They, they, they never tell the lowlights. And when you right. do tell the lowlights, like you said, that kind of makes that connection. And then you learn your, you understand your player at a personal level. So that helps you coaching later on because now you've built that connection. Right. Of course. I, I love that. Okay. So you have, Obviously, you have a uh, very brilliant career. You you talk to a lot of people. You see a lot of quarterbacks. What's something that high school coaches can do with their quarterbacks that would help prepare their quarterbacks for the future, for college, or if they're, you know, lucky enough to go to the NFL that you aren't seeing that they're doing right now? Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing is that, you know, there are certain questions that are so universal that, once again, there's not one answer for it. Um the first thing that I tell every coach and the first thing that I tell every quarterback um, is as they're developing and moving on and, and, and chasing their dream, you need to understand who you are as a player. Us as coaches, we need to understand who our players are as players. And so we need to be able to coach around their strengths. We need to be able to identify their strengths and play to those things as opposed to expecting everybody to fit into what we do. Um, And so I think that's where it starts. So if you're going to say, you know, what am I going to do to help my quarterback at the next level? Well, I'm going to figure out what his strengths are and I'm going to try to push to those strengths. So a, he can be more successful in high school. We can accentuate those strengths and the things that set him apart. Um, But that doesn't mean I'm not going to coach to his weaknesses either. Uh, I'm going to try to identify those and play to those. Um, but again, if, if there's one thing that I would, I'm going to take my, my quarterbacks and try to do for them in high school, it's teach them how to see defenses. It's teaching them to learn to see defenses. That I believe if you can know what you're seeing and you can get your eyes to the right spot, you've got a much better chance of succeeding than anybody else. The sooner you can do that, the better you can understand that the better advantage you're going to have. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how fast you can run or how far you can throw. If you can understand that, you will have an advantage over most quarterbacks coming out of high school. And again, if you can stay advanced in that area, you will have an advantage over most quarterbacks at whatever level you play at. 
if you can understand the nuances and what you're trying to do on every particular play, and then I can worry about the physical part of it and I can try to help you with the technique. Um, but again, the way I look at it too is I go back to when I was playing in high school. Never had a quarterback coach, never had a quarterback guru, uh, never had anybody teach me how to throw a football. I learned how to throw a football by picking it up in my front yard and winging it around, uh, playing with my buddies in the backyard. And so, um, you know, I remember when I went off to college, I didn't know anything about anything. You know, they put something up on the board. Hey, draw up this coverage. Coverage? I, I don't know what that is. I've always just been looking at who's open. And so the farther you go, I think the more you'll continue to learn technique stuff. Because there's a lot of guys that will help, you know, be able to teach some of that stuff. Or just as you learn and, and you grow and you get around people. Um, to me, if I can give you an advantage mentally over someone else, um, I believe there's lots of guys that can come in and help you physically. Uh, so that to me is always my approach with my quarterbacks is how much can you handle mentally? Because I want to push you in that area. So whatever it is, you can succeed at the next level. Cause I think that's, what's going to separate you. And, you know, just give an example is that, you know, my quarterback in high school, my previous high school was Keaton Slovis, who was actually the, the, the uh, freshman uh, all American from, from USC that played quarterback for him this past year. And you know, and I told him that all the time, you know, we played again at a high school that we couldn't run the football. And I told him, I don't know how many times I am asking you to do more as a high school quarterback than any high school quarterback in the country. Yep. And there's times that it sucks. And there's times where everything's going to be blamed on you because you're asked to do a whole bunch, but a, you can handle it. And B, this is going to help you because you will play at the next level. This is going to help you down the road because you're going to be so much more mature and have handled so much more and understand more mentally uh, than probably anybody else you're going to compete against right away when you move to the next level. And sure enough, you know, he got the job at USC and became a, a freshman All-American there and had an unbelievable season. But it was because mentally he had a better sense of what he was doing. So he wasn't overwhelmed when he got to that next level. The physical part we worked on as well as we could. And there was a lot of growth that he needed to make in the physical area, but I knew he would get those reps. What I didn't know was who would ever be able to coach him mentally like I could and push him in those levels and, and force the issue and, and teach him the whys to it. Um, so that was, that's always been to me, most important thing. I'm going to give you the whys. I'm going to give you the answers. I'm going to tell you, you know, why we're doing things and give you an advantage to be able to mentally understand things uh, because that to me, is where most guys end up separating themselves or allows them to keep going farther because they can handle it. Again, we see guys like the Lamar Jacksons and those guys that are so ridiculous physically that they go farther and farther and farther without having to know that stuff. But most guys are like myself, um, that they ain't going to get that far on the physicals. So you better be able to separate yourself with the mental part of it. Um, and that to me, I think is, is the most important thing. And I think the thing that's most neglected at the high school level you know you get teams that can block and so they you know put these quarterbacks out there and they let them run around for seven seconds and then they wing the ball up you know they play seven on seven um and i watch the quarterback go left and then right and then back to left and then they wing it down the field you know we'll play seven on seven and if i think my quarterback's taking too long i call a sack on us i'm like get the ball in your hands you know that's not real football we can't play that way I don't care if we win the seven on seven tournament. I'm trying to help this kid understand what's going to make it successful in real football. And so, um, so again, that's, that's my approach to it. You know, as you said, probably because it's my strength, probably because it's what separated me, but I truly believe that's what can separate guys as the talent level starts to mesh and get closer. How are you going to separate yourself? Cause very few of us are going to separate ourselves by being the, just the most physically talented guy. Okay, so let's say I'm a coach. I just I stumble upon this. I'm listening to to you. That resonates. What can I do to start helping my quarterback? Is it like a quarterback school in the off season? Is it should I be showing them game film of colleges? Like, what can I do to help build that knowledge? Um, you know, I mean, I think the first thing is just understand why you're coaching what you're coaching, right? I mean, that to me is why you know, just like that nuance of that hitch play, you know, I'm trying to get them to visualize and understand 
Okay, when we call hitch and you're reading that side, here's what you're going to see. Here are our options, right? Corners off, you've got quarters, you've got three, basically when we're talking about, you know, main coverages. Okay, when that happens, here's what's going to be underneath it, right? Here's where your eyes need to be right now. And so it's trying to simplify the game and teach the game, um, but having a why to it. You know, being able to, to connect the dots for them as opposed to just saying, hey, we're calling this play, throw it to the open guy. And so um, that to me becomes the, the real key is as coaches to coach, you know, to, to have a reason and a method to our madness. And, you know, being able to simplify the game for these guys um, where they know they're going to be successful. Um, so, I mean, I don't think you have to create a whole school. I don't think you have to overdo it. I don't think they have to go to a guru or go to 27 camps. Um, but I do think they need somebody that understands the why. And that's all I try to do with my quarterbacks is give you the why. Tell you why we're reading it this way. Ta tell you why we're running the play this way. Why we're releasing this way. Where your eyes need to be. Where they need to start. And the more I can share with them, the more I can push the envelope, the better off they're going to be. And then what they can't grasp, we'll simplify it. And then we'll just slowly push and see where we can get them. But, um, but I think that's the most important thing. Knowledge is key in everything, but knowledge is key for a quarterback to know the why, to know where my eyes are, to know what's good against what coverage is and why it's good, to know why we we're doing what we're doing um, so I can go out there and I can feel confident in what we're doing because I know the why. I know why we're attacking this guy. I know why we're releasing outside on that burst release and why that's vital for us as opposed to just, hey, let's run to run. Hey, I've seen somebody else on film do this where they run two hitches. Let's run that because it's, it's successful. Okay, well, how are we going to run it? Why are we going to run it that way? What's the key to it? Um, and so that, to me, I think is the biggest thing because, you know, you're not going to be able to ask a high school quarterback to spend 20 hours with you every week. So understand why you're doing it. And you learn so you can share that knowledge with them in the limited amount of time that you have. That's a beautiful question. I got to ask, I know you're, you're a big book reader and just hearing you talk about why a lot. Have you ever read Why by Simon Sinek? Know your why? I have not. Okay. Because he talks about that. He says all great, it's really a business book, but all great businesses have a why and then they expand out that way. And mm -hmm. just you talking about the why and telling the kids the quarterback's why just resonated. So right. I'm, well, and I mean, to go along with that too, like the one thing that I always ask my quarterbacks after they do something is why, right? I always want my guys to be able to give me a reason. It might not be the right reason, but I always need a reason. I tell them that all the time. I don't want to hear I don't know because now you're not playing the position the right way. You can tell me, well, I thought the safety was going that way. I was looking at him and, and he didn't do exactly what I thought. And that's why I threw the interception. I can live with that. If you can tell me why you did something, that's the most important thing. And it will carry with them no matter how long they play, is that when I was in the NFL, even if I made a, a bad decision, if I could go back and say why I made that bad decision, what I saw that made me go there, uh, it helped to answer those questions for me. And it helped me to be able to drill that with my quarterback moving forward. Okay, you thought the safety, okay, let's work that safety next time on that route a couple times and give you a better feel for it. But I couldn't stand when somebody just said, I don't know because that ball's in your hands and, and we need you to protect us. And you're, you know, it's a, it's the greatest commodity. So I can't be the, you living out there going, I don't really know why I'm just making stuff up as we go. And so that why is, is very important when I coach. Okay. I love that. And I'm going to start using that too. Now on the sideline, explain your why, because then you're making them explain it and they're, they're learning. And you're holding them accountable to, to see what you want them to see. And, you know, to me, it's important, too, because if they don't know why or they don't know what they were doing, then I'm not doing a good enough job as a coach of teaching them what I need them to, to know. And so but when them when they say, I don't know, I don't know if that's me. I don't know if that's them. I don't know if the game's too fat. I don't know what's going on. And sometimes they can just tell me, I don't know what I saw. OK, I can live with that. You don't know. We got to get you to know. But I can live with you being honest with me about what. What you, what's going through your mind so I can try to help you the best way possible. Okay. Now I have, I have to ask a question. 
I, this off season or this uh, quarantine season, I like to call it, I've been diving into the scissors play that Washington state runs and stuff like that. And I know that y'all ran a lot of scissors when you were with the Rams. Do you have any coaching points? All right. Well, t- tell me exactly what you mean by the scissors play. Uh, uh, th- you draw it th- up for me? Uh, okay. No, tell me. I will walk me through. So three by one. Okay. Um, number okay. one receiver runs like a five yard in. Okay. So we're here. Yes, sir. Like okay. a five-year number two runs a uh, post and number three runs a corner. Okay. Number three runs a corner. Okay. Well, I, I'll tell you first, we didn't run this play a lot. And, okay. But we ran similar things. A lot of people run similar things. Okay. And so, again, every time I put a play in or call a play, I'm going to ask you why, or I'm going to ask myself, why am I calling this play? Okay. What am I trying to hit on this play? And so that's the first thing I'm going to ask. So just simply here, and you don't have to have the, the right answer. I just want an answer from you. What are you trying to hit on this play? When we, I'm trying to hit the corner because right. that's we, what, that's see- what I figured. you're trying okay. to hit the corner. Okay. So you're trying to hit the corner here. So in essence, what you're trying to do is you're trying to high low somebody out here, mm-hmm. right? So, okay, so that's where I'm going to start with this whole concept because when I when I put in plays, and again because I'm coaching at the high school level, um, I design my plays to beat zone coverages. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do because we're not going to see man that much, and if we see man, I can create opportunities for us against man. So plays that I design are designed against zone coverages. So the first thing that I see, and again, this is where my mind works, is if you're trying to hit this, then I need to make sure that I'm high-lowing that same zone. I've got two guys going to that same zone. So I'm never going to let this guy run away from that zone. So in essence, right? We can just say, let's just say we have, we have cover two here. Mm-hmm. All right. So that safety's taking the post. Okay. And the idea is we're going to high low this corner out here. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to midline this. And this guy pushes to five and then he takes off. I'm going to drop back here and take this. And I'm going to let that guy take that. And I've got no play. Okay. So when I see a play that is running everybody to a different zone, I'm telling myself that's a man beater. Right. And so, you know, in simplistic form, you know, if we were running it this same way, I'm just going to lock this guy on the hitch, you know, for the sole purpose of now I'm high lowing this zone because that's what I'm trying to throw. I'm going to isolate that. So if I get that corner over there, right. And he's trying to, to midline the two, then I can at least tie low them and I can force the issue that we got two guys against one guy. Okay. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do on this play. You know, the other thing about running this play in this particular way that I don't necessarily like is here's the problem is that this particular concept here, a corner and a hitch. And I, and I already talked about it on the smash concept. Everybody's got it in. But that particular concept is not necessarily a great concept against any corner off look right now. It doesn't mean it can't be good because we often say that's a, that's a play that can work against any coverage. And of course it can work against any coverage, but the reason I say it's not necessarily a great play against corner off is because I'm not isolating anybody on this play. Yes. I'm going to try to beat this guy with the hitch throw because I'm expecting this guy to play deep third or deep quarter because that's where he's at. So I can beat this guy with the throw and it becomes a good play, but I'm not putting any pressure on this guy to have to cover one zone because that's not his job. This guy's zone is there. This guy's zone is there. So it's not necessarily a great play to run it this way. Reason I say that is so, If I was running this play, and again, if I'm seeing a cover two team, 
I might run it just like that, although I would lock this hitch. So this guy gets engaged here and we put the pressure on the safety. But against any normal team, I'm going to run this play like this. So if I get corner off, because once again, I'm trying to hit the corner. So I want to use up that guy that's in that spot. I want to attack that zone. So I'm going to run the post out here to get that guy out of there. So now once I get that guy out of there, and it could be the safety as well if we were seeing cover two, but once I get that deep guy out of there, now I always have an isolation on that guy, right? And so I am clearing that guy out of there. Um, and so I'm going to run it this way because of that. Okay, again, I'll go a little more in depth on, on how I teach and why I teach what I teach. Okay, so remember I told you earlier on that I never straight release number two, right? So now we're going to inside release number two, and then he's going to push up and run his corner. Okay, why, why inside release on this one, outside release on other ones? Well, here's the thing, that anytime I've got a play – where I got a guy going to the flat, I'm basically telling my quarterback, you're reading the flat defender, right? Otherwise, why am I putting a guy in a flat if we're not reading the flat defender? It doesn't make sense. So I'm telling you that you are reading that flat defender, okay? More times than not, I want this play against corner off as well. Not that we can't read it against cover two, but I'll get to that in a second. So I want it against corner off. So if I get corner off here, and I'm reading a flat defender, I want to put all the pressure on this guy. Remember I said it early on. I want to create width and depth, or I want to create movement by the defense right now. So when I release inside, I just put this guy in a bind. What are you going to do? You want to jam my receiver to the inside? I'm taking the flat right now, game over. I release inside, and you know you've got flat coverage. you got to come off on the flat. I just gave you a free release to get up on my safety or get into the second level. And we have a bonus right there, but we are putting all the pressure on one defender to have to move. Now I'm giving my quarterback a quick read that he can see this guy. And if that guy doesn't move or that guy holds, he's in a bind right now. If he does what we expect him to do and he moves out here, now we've got our high low and we just live with it from there. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. It does. Okay, a lot of guys. So, again, we can run this against any coverage technically, right, because we're going to read that flat defender. All right? I'm not a big fan of this particular version of this play, meaning us in a normal alignment out here against cover two. Okay, why not? Well, because ultimately, right, we talked about it before on the other version of this, that ultimately you've got a high low on the corner out here, right? We're on a corner flat. Why not cover two um, as opposed to, you know, any other coverage where we're reading the sandbacker flat to, to corner? Well, here's why. When we're in a normal split, all right, the thing that we're always trying to do, like I just said, with the defense is I always want them to move because once they move and they show me what they're doing, now as a quarterback, I get a read, right? Shoulders are turned. They're running. They're moving, they're standing still. When we're moving, we gain an advantage. Okay, when we do this and we're in a normal cover two from a normal lineman, we don't force this guy to ever move because we can't ever outflank him because he's sitting out there on the numbers. So we never get him to turn with our flat. So this guy can sit here and midline this play every single time. You got to make a long throw to the flat. I'll come up and make that play because it's a long throw. You're never gonna get him to turn his shoulder. So he midlines this from cover two and your quarterback has to throw it. And now he can take the flat and fall off to the corner. And it really becomes a tough read because we allow him to play both. Okay. So if I'm playing a team that plays a lot of cover two and that's one of my bread and butter plays cause I love the play. It's one of my favorite plays in football. I'm going to now stack this up. I'm going to bunch it up here. Okay. And we'll just say they're playing cover two again. All right. So we are going to run our concept same way here and go to the flat. All right. So you say to yourself, well, it's still cover two. And that guy's still out there. 
So why does it make it any better? Well, the reason it makes it better is because now this guy has to cover width and depth, right? Before, all he had to do was cover depth, cover the flat, cover the corner. He was already in a width position where he never had to move. Now that we brought him into a tight split, we have created space now out to these numbers. So once this guy gets outside of him on a flat, this guy's got to move. He doesn't move. We take the flat and we win. He tries to midline this. He can't because this guy just won with leverage on him and we'll take it. Soon as that guy turns and covers with his shoulders and flattens his shoulders to the line of scrimmage or runs out here, he no longer can double team this and midline that and play back to the corner. So once again, it's the same play. It's nuances of the same play, but what are we trying to do? What are we trying to attack? And how most importantly, do we create movement by the defense that allows a simpler read, a better read, and a quicker read for my quarterback is always what I'm trying to do. And so it's, it's coached off of little nuances like that. Same play, same play you guys all have in your playbook. It's just those nuances help me and help my quarterback to know what he's looking at and get a simpler read or more movement that creates an open opportunity and him to be able to process much quicker. Uh, good Lord, man. That was amazing. I, I love that. So, okay. On, on that outside receiver, he's stemming, is he stemming the corner then making that corner move and then going, or is that just like, what are you teaching him? I know the number yeah. two, you have him yeah. move inside so, or outside. So again, there's different ways to do it depending on what you're seeing. But uh, normally the way we teach it is, you know, to me, offense is built on spacing, mm -hmm. right? When you're tacking a zone, it's about covering areas. It's about pressuring space. And so what we always try to do when we get into a tight alignment is as much as possible, we try to expand. And what we, we say is attack your alignment. So attack where your initial alignment is because we still want the spacing of our plays to stay the same. If we condense down space, we're making it easier on a defense to cover that space. So we stack and we bunch to create alignments, to create leverage um, on a defense more than we do it for any other purpose. So we are always trying to create that space, engage certain players. Um, you know, reason we expand sometimes is we want to engage the corner so it opens up something else, or we want to put pressure on the quarterback or the corner so we can get something else off of it. And so that's kind of our normal rules. Now, it can be different on specific plays, but our normal rules is we're just going to put you in an advantage position, but then we want to, you to create and expand that spacing again so the defense still has to cover the whole field. They still have to cover, cover that spacing, and we put pressure on them to have to cover again. Width and depth as opposed to just one or the other um, because that's what makes it harder on a defense is when they got to go two different directions. When we allow them to stay one place, and play just one of those things, we allow the game to be easier on the defense. Okay. A um, couple coaches wanted to know, let's say you have a guy. You know, most of us have that one guy. Do you have any concepts or plays that go to that specific guy, or do you move that guy around within the concept? Yeah, like I mean, thought process? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, again, depends on your player. Um, but, you know, just for example, my son played wide receiver for me. Um you know, when I was coaching the first high school I was at. And there was a year he caught 96 balls. And the reason he caught 96 balls was because he was smart and he was willing to learn it and he was willing to line up anywhere and do anything we asked him to do. So I always tell my guys, my dogs, my guys, hey, okay, you're our best player. If you can only play X, it is easy to take you out of the game. I will try to get you the ball as many times as I can with you at the X spot. But if you can only line up in one spot on the numbers outside, if I'm a good defense, I can always roll to you. I can double team you anytime I want. If you can learn every position for me, and it's a reason why we teach our concepts conceptually. I never tell guys, you're our Z, you're our F, you're our X. I come in and say, here's our concept. You need to learn one, two, and three. Learn them all. You know, learn them by con concepts and know what to do in every position, because then if you can do it, I'm going to put you in the best situation to succeed. I mean, when Antonio Brown was catching 120 balls a year, they designed every play for him. 
When Julio Jones is out there, you design every play for him. Michael Thomas catches 120 balls, and he's the only guy in that offense that's a wide receiver. Why? Because they design their offense around their best players. I want to do the same thing. The more limited you are, the less you can do, the less you're going to have opportunities to catch the ball. The more you can do, the more I'm going to design my offense around you. I mean, whatever, say what you want. You know, I had coaches say, hey, you just threw it to his son every time. Hey, he was our best player and I could do whatever I wanted with him. And I threw it to him every time, you know, when he was open, but I designed around him. So a defenses, if they wanted to focus on him, it opened up my other players that weren't quite as good, but B, if they didn't want to focus on him, yeah, he's going to get the ball every time. I mean, how many running backs do you see in, in you know, in football that rush for 3000 yards? Okay. Well, cause you give him the ball every time. Well, heck yeah. I give him the ball every time because he's running for 3000 yards. I mean, it's just, it's, it's basic football is that I want to get the ball to my best players as much as I possibly can. And so my approach is the more you can do, the more we can do with you. And I tell my guys that early on, I am like, Hey guys, this is equal opportunity. Everybody can get the ball on any given play, right? Our best players, we will try to get you the ball as much as we can based on what you're capable of doing. If my second best player can do everything and my best player can do one thing, I'm going to design my offense around my second best player. And I will get it to my best player when I can and when the situation designs itself that way. But I'm going to build it around my second best player because he can do everything. And now, okay, maybe not as good as the one, but he's my second best guy and I'm going to get him the ball as much as I can because he's my second best player. So that's how I approach it. And I tell them that early, learn it all boys. And then you can have whatever you want. And if you are our best guy, I will put you in a position to catch it every time I can. And that's just the nature of, of how it is. And so um, we design around that, you know, my running backs, my running backs have caught, as I told you, 50 balls, you know, a season. Um, and we tell them, Hey, if you can only come out of the backfield, now you're JT's unicorn, right? <laughs> you get, you get check downs when you get check downs. If you can motion out and be a receiver for me and run the routes and know the concepts, now it just opens you up that when we have a pass play, I can put you at the primary guy in the pass play. We got a run play, I can put you primary in the run play. And now you become the focal point of everything we can do because you have the ability to do lots of things. Otherwise, I don't know how many times my, my quarterback's going to get to the check down, brother. So if you want to catch it, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And so I tell them that early on and I, I put that pressure on them. And then at the end of the day, I've got to, you know, cater to what they can do and what they're willing to do. Um, but I tell them up front, you know, Hey, this is on you, you know, you'll get out of this, what you put into it. And um, you know, we'll give you as many opportunities as you allow us to give you um, if you're our best player. Okay. And that's like a very basketball -y philosophy. Do you think that comes from your first love of basketball? Like, you, you know, it's kind of hard if you have, let's say, LeBron James. He can play power forward. He can be a shooting guard. He can be a point guard. So it's hard for defenses to adjust for that. And you're kind of taking that same mentality and putting it on the football field. Yeah, I mean, but again, I mean, to, the bottom line is what I know about football is, you know, every team's got a weakness, mm -hmm. Right my goal is to identify and attack that weakness. And so if one team's strength is their, their corners and my best player is out there against their best players, okay, we may be better or it may be even and we may win that 50% of the time. But if my best player can now go against their linebacker, okay, let's go. Uh, you know, put my third and fourth best players out on the corners and use those guys up. And let's attack where they're weak. And so that's my approach. I don't know where it comes from. I just think it comes from being a smart football coach is I'm going, excited. hey, where am I strong? Where are they weak? You know, and how can I attack their weakness with what I do? And the more I can do that and the more I can do with my best players, the better chance I have. You know, I mean, it's no different than saying my strength is my offensive line. I'm going to run the football at them because they're weak as opposed to going, well, I you know, got a really good receiver out there. Let me throw it every down when we're better up front than we are on the outside. So it's just, to me, it's just playing to your strengths and identifying attacking the weakness of a defense. Um, and my goal every week is how do I do that? And, you know, the next goal is how do I do that with my best players 
if I can, right? I want my best players against their weakest players. That's just the nature of, of what the game is. <laughs> I like that. It's just like common sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it that way, but. Okay, well, we have been at this for an hour and a half. I don't want to take up too much of your time because this is just a dream of mine to actually I can go a little longer if there's guys there that got more questions. Heck yeah. A lot of them are asking, do you have a favorite two point play? Uh, no, not necessarily a favorite. Uh, okay. because again, I think uh, to me, two point plays are specials. And so, um, I always design those every week. You know, I, really? I look at what, I look at what a defense is doing. Um, and then I try to come up with either my best two or three short yardage plays or, knowing what a defense does specifically creating those things. But I will say a lot of my two point play, especially, you know, obviously in the past game is I'm creating a lot of movement together. So I'm trying to, as much as anything, fool guys, as much as I'm trying to design the perfect play, okay. uh, you know, creating motion and, and forcing guys to, to run across and, and quick switches and, and things like that, um, that play to our strengths. Um, but a lot of my two point plays, as opposed to just being a base part of our offense or something that we normally do, they're designed specifically to attack somebody or create lots of movement and, uh, and consternation on the defense. So they can't follow us. And, and I'm basically trying to fool them for two yards, fool them to get it into my best player's hands and, and make them tackle him before he gets two yards. <laughs> okay. I like that. Um, a couple of coaches want to know, uh, offensive line wise, how do you protect? Are you half slide, full slide? Do you have a different pass uh, protections? Are you just mainly, hey, this is the one we're going to use and we're going to get great at it? What? Uh, yeah, we use a couple different pass protections, but you know, primarily they're you know primarily they're the same. And we're more of a, a man blocking scheme. I don't like full slides because it it's too easy to get guys on edges. And again, it's just never been our strength. So we're always trying to create help and double teams where we can. So we're trying to identify guys that we're going to block, block the most dangerous with our big guys and, and, and get our backs out. Um, so sometimes it can become like a half slide and then a man, um, but it really is dependent on, you know, what we're doing, but as much as we can, we're trying to create angles for our guys and, um, and, you know, and trying to create help where we're weakest. Um, and so by identifying men as opposed to full sliding, um, you know, we don't get put on edges as much. Um, and again, we don't have a lot of protections. We try to keep that simple. The biggest thing we do is we build in different check downs to go with our protection. So the offensive line is primarily doing the same thing every time. But I need my, my check down to be able to go both directions. I need my check down to be able to do a couple different things um, so I can run all of our concepts, you know, both ways, three by one, two by two, and all of that stuff to give us uh, the biggest advantage. Okay. Um, coach wants to know, are you more zone run or gap run in your run scheme? Um, yeah, we, we've never been more zone run. I, I've never really been able to teach. And now I know a lot of people are teaching the inside zone. That's kind of a combination zone man concept, which I like better. What I haven't ever been able to do with the high school uh, level players, and again, this is just the guys I've been around, is to get them to understand that they're not blocking men and they're blocking area. And so inevitably at high school level, you know, again, you're teaching them, hey, we're, you know, we're running the, the inside zone to the right and you guys are responsible for like the four down and then the mic. You know, but but I don't really want them to ever think they're responsible for the mic. I want the mic to come to them and them to just work together as a unit. But inevitably, somebody goes, oh, we got the mic? And they take off and they go block the mic and we leave a huge gap and we get blown up because they don't work together. And so, again, that's my teams. My teams have never been great up front. Um, so we've never been great at the, the zone run scheme. So I'm trying to create more man and angles and quick hitters. Um, you know, to get up, to get up in there quickly. Um, so, cause again, my goal on our runs is, is to try to get four to five yards. We're not a team that, you know, can expect to, to break out for fifties and sixties very often. That's a bonus for us. Uh, so we do a lot of traps. Um, we do a lot of pull schemes uh, again, just to, to create angles for ourselves and get, 
creases more than we do the zone. And again, I think that's more player related than it is um, coach related, but I just think it's harder to get five guys to work together and be able to flow and, and be one solid unit up there in high school. I'd rather go, Hey, you're blocking this guy. We're giving you the angle, kick out, hit the hole and let's go. Okay. Cause it makes it simple for the OL. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, a couple of coaches wanted to know, what do you do when you're playing a defense that is uh, kind of like a pattern read coverage? How, how does your game plan change or does it change at all? Well, um, again, we're going to always have reasons why we do what we do to help influence that pattern read. I would have to know exactly what they're talking about. Like, for instance, if they're talking about a quarters read team uh, that reads the release of number two, um, and then that frees them up from there. Um, you know, so if we know that we're going to attack that coverage. Um, and again, just if you can conceptually think about it, if it's, if they're a quarters team and they're reading our number two, we're going to try to attack that team by adding a third guy to the mix. And normally for us, it's going to be adding the back to the mix because then we can, we can clear out that safety or we can get the, the, we can put the pressure on them by putting two guys vertical instead of allowing them to see one guy disappear and be able to double guys. And so if, if we realize teams are trying to do that, we're going to try to use up the guys they want to double with and create our concepts based off of that. Um, as opposed to just sticking to our playbook and going, okay, hopefully we can beat them with this play or this play. We're going to identify where they're weak and what puts them in a bind by trying to rot read and we're going to attack it. And, you know, most times within our offense, we've got the ability to run most of our plays. Um, so for instance, I mean, we got the ability to run curl flat with two receivers. I've also got the ability to run double curls with a flat a lot of three receivers. So if that vertical push by number two affects that safety and makes him stay inside so they can no longer get the double team to the outside or they can get the squeeze or play to their, you know, to, to leverage, now we'll do that instead and, and, and we'll attack that week with a three-man curl concept. Even though we're trying to throw the same play outside, we've got an ability to do it in a different way so we can use up uh, or we can play to uh, to the weakness of that defense, or we can attack their leverage to be able to still get the throw that we want. Okay, great answer. God, I love asking. And again, questions. I don't know if that's exactly the defense they're talking about, but uh, but just give you an example. Yes. Um, okay. One coach wants to know what's the toughest defensive scheme you have dealt with on the high school level. Um, taking out Jimmys and Joes if their guys are better than you. Yeah, yours. and again. To me, it's, it's not so much about coverage. It's about front for me at the high school level. Uh, teams that run, you know, three fours or hybrid three fours uh, and do a lot of movement with their front seven is what's always given me the most problems. Um, you know, the ability to bring pressure but drop an edge linebacker um, gives me a lot more pressure than only having one linebacker over there um, where he either has to come or cover it. You know, when they can bring the inside backer and drop the outside guy and play into that zone, uh, plus that movement, and it creates, you know, we talk about, you know, the man blocking that we like to do just because of angles. Three fours can create lots of, you know, when you've got to fan out to a deep outside linebacker with your guard and tackle, it puts those guys on skates a lot more. And so for me, the tougher schemes are the ones that are doing more interiorly, which forcing us to have to think or, you know, creating different guys for my quarterback to have to read, you know, three, four defenses, right? When we attack a three, four defense, they technically have one more backer inside that my quarterback has to worry about. So, you know, so if you can envision it, right, we, we're not going to do as much two receiver stuff into the three, four, because they've got an extra backer sitting in there than they normally would. So we've got to add a third guy to the mix and overload a side. So we use up that extra backer to that side. And now we get back to the reads that my quarterback has otherwise. So again, most of this stuff is interior where it gives me the most problems because again, it, it, it should be easier to run against some of that stuff. 
my teams have never been great running teams. So that's where we struggle. I think if a three, four team shows up and you're a good run team, you can force them out of that, or you can create some issues for them. Just unfortunately for us, we've been primarily past teams and those are the teams, whether it be protection wise or scheme wise, that will give me more problems because they can do a lot more things and it forces my quarterback to see a lot more things and have to think a little bit more. Okay. A um, couple coaches want to know what's your favorite man beater. Do you have one or is it just like a uh, week by week thing? Yeah. I mean, it is it, it, again, when you say man beater, you got to tell me how they're playing man. You got to tell me who their, who their greatest players, are, you know, who their best players are, where I'm getting matchups. Um, so again, I, you know, I, there's just a lot of good things against man, you know, but it's just, it really depends on what I'm trying to do. Is it, is it an isolation guy? Is it a concept where I'm trying to create, you know, interference and rubs? Um, is it trying to isolate a guy in space? Uh, sorry, coach. That's, that's a tough question. Cause I mean, I got a million plays I like. Um, so, uh, it's hard to say, you know, but, it, but again, I mean, you know, just going back to what I was telling you guys before, you know, just for instance, you know, that release pattern that we do on, you know, that, that scissors concept, as you called it, you know, that's a play that's designed against zone coverages, but our strict release pattern, because it's how we always do it. We create, rubs and opportunities we create angles that these guys want to combo coverage it where we're going in and out and we're forcing leverage for ourselves and so again I, at the high school level I can't sit there and create 20 new plays every week because we're playing against man so we also create some of our things and, and create uh, angles natural rubs uh, interference by the way we run our concepts that allow us to create easier or, or, or quick concepts against man coverage. And once again, I don't need to throw the ball 40 yards down the field in high school to get big plays. I need to get this good player against this guy with leverage out here in space and I'm going to make him tackle him. And so a lot of the stuff I'm doing in high school is doing stuff like that. That's already built in that. We're not reteaching it. Guys don't have to see a bunch of things. Hey, do what we do. And we're going to create an opportunity for ourselves based off teaching the concept and running it. Uh, to both attack man and zone. Um, and so a lot of the, you know, our concepts will stay the same and I like them a lot uh, against man and zone because we're doing some of those things. Okay. Um, Coach Noah wants to know what is the most difficult thing you have found to teach your quarterback? Well, I mean, I think the most difficult thing is when you try to teach half field reads, you know, when you, when you're trying to get, you know, quarterbacks to understand hey, I could go back and give you double curl on both sides. I could do that for you. And, you know, hopefully I'll call it against cover three and you pick a side and we're good. But I'm not so arrogant to think that I'm going to call the perfect play against the perfect coverage every time if there's a team that does multiple things. And so my goal is to always say, hey, quarterback, I'm going to give you answers. You will have answers to attack whatever they throw at you. Now the key for you is to know what they're throwing at you and get to the right spot. And that's the hardest thing, right? To teach high school quarterbacks to be able to read coverages, see coverages, make quick decisions to get to the right portion of their read at the right time. And again, I can make it simple and I can call plays that are good against anything. Um, but I just don't think that always gives an advantage to your team. Uh, and so I don't like to do that. But I do have the capabilities of doing that um, you know, if my quarterback can't handle it, but that's the hardest thing in what we do offensively is to get a quarterback to understand his first read could be on either side, depending on what the defense throws at him and to see that and get to that guy and be able to process things quickly. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, coach Jones wants to know what's, do you have any advice for younger coaches that want to like move up in the chain or just when they first start getting in there, like what should they be focused on? Um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think there's a couple ways to look at it. Uh, you know, first of all is you want to move up in any capacity. You know, if you want to move up just to move up and coach at another level, learn as much as you can possibly learn, 
right? Know as much as you can possibly know about as much as you can possibly know. Um, so learn all the positions, learn why, you know, when I was in, in St. Louis, um, when Mike Marks came in, uh, you know, he taught me more about football than any coach I'd ever been around. But the thing that always jumped out to me about him was he knew everything. He could coach every position, you know, and, and all of this stuff tied together and it, and it made sense together. And, and so we had a knowledge base of the entire offensive side of the field. And, uh, and I think that's what separated it. And so I think that's one thing. If you, if you don't care what you're coaching and you just want to move up, gain as much knowledge about as many things as you possibly can. So you can step in and be successful um, if you're asked to do different things. Um, if it's about, you know, just, hey, I'm really good at this or I want to be this kind of coach. Um, I think it's just about knowledge, you know, more than anything else is to be able to sit down and answer the why, you know, to be able to sit down with a coach and ask questions on why they're doing it that way. What's the reason? And, you know, I always tell my quarterbacks um, that, you know, you have to take ownership of what you're doing, your situation, take ownership of it. And by taking ownership of it, that doesn't mean you just go into a coach and say, hey, coach, I don't like that play. Well, OK, why don't you like it? Right. What can make it better? What's your knowledge of why? You know, what's what's the problem in your mind about this play? Because we're trying to throw this. And how can I make this better for you? And do you have an answer for them? You know, can you challenge guys and have reasons for why you do what you do? Like a lot of us could move up just by listening to a good coach and then taking what he says and go, okay, but this is how we do it. I don't know why. This is just how we do it. And so you're there long enough and you get, you advance and you get the next position and you move up. You know, I had offense coordinators in, in the NFL that I didn't trust, you know, with anything. You know, that they put in plays and they didn't know why they were putting them in. You know, they put in plays based on something they saw on film, even though it wasn't structurally sound. And so I had to go into them and say, coach, I don't want to run this play. And here's why. Because if they do this, which is what I expect them to do, I don't have an answer. You're, you're putting me in a bind. Well, they won't do that. Well, that's not good enough for me. And so to me, it's about having knowledge and having understanding and knowing what's good and bad and knowing why. And again, that doesn't mean you're always going to be right. It just means you have a theory and an understanding that makes sense to you on why this is this, this way. Now go talk to the coach. Oh, why do you do that? Oh, shoot, man, that makes more sense than what I was thinking. Okay. Okay. You do it because of this. Okay. What about if they do this? Now, why do you do it? Okay. That makes, shoot. I just checked off all the boxes and I'm going to start teaching it that way. But now I have all the answers to the questions and I have a knowledge of what I'm doing. And, and I believe at the end of the day, there's two ways to advance, right? You can advance because you're somebody's buddy, because you've been there a long time, uh, because it's the next position for you, or you can advance because you're better than the guy that you're competing against, or because you deserve that opportunity. And so to me, in anything that I've ever done, I wanted to advance because I was the better guy, because I could handle it more, that I had more knowledge. I could do it better than the guy in front of me. And so that would be what I would say to all you guys is be better than the guy around you. Be better than the guy that you're interviewing against. When you get an opportunity, learn everything you can learn. So when that next opportunity comes, you're ready for it and you can handle it. And you've got reasons why you're doing what you're doing. And again, I think a big part of that is being willing to challenge what's out there and not challenge it as you're wrong. It's challenging it as why, why do you do it that way? I want to know that everything we do has a purpose. It has a reason. There's a method to the madness of everything. I don't ever want to just be, hey, we do it because we do it. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's better than the other thing. We just, this is how we've always done it. Well, okay, then why is it better than this? Or why is it better than that? Or does it really matter? And if it does, why am I doing it this way as opposed to that way? And so I just think knowledge is key as a coach. Um, you know, of course, you know, head coaches and those things, I mean, being able to, to lead and connect with people and all that stuff plays into it. But just from a strict football standpoint, to me, it's always about knowledge. Knowledge is king and knowledge can always separate you. And so gain as much knowledge and tap into as many people as you can. Challenge everything, challenge what you believe, challenge what other people are telling you to develop in your mind the best system to be able to coach your position, 
you know, your side of the field or, or to coach in general. Okay. So young coach just got into it. I know I got to get knowledge because you gave that talk and I'm ready to run through the wall right now. Just, just so you know, <laughs> from that, what's the first step I should do to start gaining that knowledge? Is it just going to college coaches and sitting in? Is it volunteering? Is it going on the internet and getting all these books and I, mean, tapes? I think all of those things can, can play into it. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you gain knowledge wherever you can gain knowledge, but once again, don't let it be blind knowledge. Right. So, you know, just because you went and listened to me teach something here doesn't mean you run back to your playbook and go, well, I'm going to put it in that way because it sounded really good when Kurt said it. You know, the next person you talk to that's really smart about football go, hey, talk me through this concept. How do you run this concept? Why do you run it that way? And, and so now I've got two things to throw on the whiteboard and go, okay, which one makes more sense to me? You know, which one has more knowledge in it? Which one attacks more things? Which one has a better basis for why they run it that way? All right, let me ask a third person. And so to me, it's don't just go to somebody that you go, hey, this guy was a really good quarterback. I'm going to listen to everything he says. No, challenge everything I say. Challenge it with other smart people. Try to develop a theory on your own that makes the most sense to you within what you're trying to accomplish. And that's why, you know, again, when you put up this play here, the first thing I'm going to ask you is why are you calling this play? What are you trying to hit? Because now once you've told me what area of the field you want to attack, now I can design a play around that to try in the best situation possible, get you that particular throw. As opposed to just going, oh, everybody runs this. Let's throw this play on the board. Well, I mean, why are they running it that way? You know, why are they running number, number one away from the zone that he's trying to influence? Why are they doing that? Okay, I need to know, you know, so talk to the coach. If you saw somebody run this, try to reach out to them and go, okay, I saw you run this. Okay, tell me why. Why do you do it this way? What are the rules behind it? Oh, okay, maybe number one is actually supposed to run a hitch. And then on that particular play, you saw the corner match to him and he knew he had man. So then he ran away. Okay, now I can live with that. Now it makes more sense. Now I have to figure out, can I teach my guys those different progressions within it. So now it makes it a better play overall, or my guys are limited. So what's the best option for my guys at the high school level that gives me the best opportunity to succeed and more importantly, throw that thing that I want to throw. So I just think it's, you know, don't ever stop learning. Don't ever stop challenging your theories and other people's theories to gain the most amount of knowledge possible. Um, and then ultimately you'll develop your own, you know, way to, to teach or your own way to, to scheme plays, your own way to coach quarterbacks. Um, but have it based on a why, why am I doing it this way? As opposed to just blindly taking what somebody says and just throw it up on the board that way. Okay. I, if there's one thing coaches that you need to take away from this interview, it is know the why, because that is so strong. Um, so on the, on the flip side, coach wants to know what's a piece of advice you can give a, a young student athlete. It doesn't have to be about football. It can be about life in general. Wow. That's a, that's a big, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, let's just start as the athlete. Okay. And the first piece of advice I, I try to give every athlete is to play every sport you possibly can. Don't ever uh, limit yourself to just one thing and try to learn that one thing. Uh, you know, I've talked to so many players throughout my time in the NFL, and I've come across two players in all my years that only played football their entire life. That I think there's nuances to other sports that help you to become a better athlete. And that doesn't mean running a 40 yard dash, um, you know, or jumping higher. It's about becoming an athlete. And, and to me, an athlete is someone that has the ability to control their body, you know, whatever that means, you know, receiver getting in and out of a cut, you know, a, a running back being able to balance up and, and go right or left. For me, a quarterback to be able to throw with their core when they're off platform, to be able to control their body, to get it going in the direction that they, that they want to go. And so I just believe there's certain things, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, uh, Patrick Mahomes play baseball. And every one of them has a tremendous ability to throw off platform 
and on the move. Wow, you know, in baseball, how many times do you get a ground ball right to you and you set up and you throw it to first? Not very often. You're usually running left, running right, have to twerk your body, have to make an accurate throw from, from shortstop with, you know, your body being able to lead you. And so there's all kinds of things. You know, play basketball. You know, my ability to be able to go to the bucket and control my body and avoid fouls and, and lay the ball up. I'm learning how to become an athlete. And I think that's the most important thing for any athlete, whatever sport, but football players is learn how to become an athlete. I will take an athlete or what we call a football player over a guy that's just athletic all day long, you know, because they understand how to play and how to control their body and how to run different routes and do those things. So if I'm talking to just an athlete, I would tell them like my kids, I force my kids to play more than one sport. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. I always want them to play basketball because that's my first love, but I don't force them to, to do that. Uh, I just say, you have to play something else. You know, if you're going to play football, you got to play something else, whatever. Son to play basketball, play lacrosse. You know, I got one son right now that wants to play Quidditch. I don't even know what that is. Running around with a stick between their legs. Harry and Potter. Having throw, and having to throw a ball through a, a circle. But I don't care because you have to learn different ways because – the game isn't played in a perfect world. So I can have you go out back and work with a quarterback coach and, and drop back against air and throw a million different routes. That's not how the game is going to be played. So I want to teach them to learn to use and, and control their body. Um, and then, you know, if I'm talking overall, I would probably say the same thing in a big picture is be, um, is be well-rounded and be balanced. That life is about being balanced. No matter what you want to do, um, you know, you want to play football, great, but play other sports, you know, be in a role sometimes where you're not the number one guy, you're not the best guy. Now you got to be the sixth man. Now you got to be the guy at the end of the bench, become well-rounded, you know, don't just focus on one thing, read books, you know, be in plays, do other things and, and enjoy the entirety of life. So you don't just limit yourself to this is all I ever want to do. There's so much out there. Um, that I would just tell everybody, get, get involved, get involved with a bunch of different things, you know, that you can be, you know, and again, you use an example, right? I played all the sports. Uh, I was involved in lots of different things and I made it to the mountaintop, right? I could tell you a million guys that did that. So to think that if I just focus on one thing, the rest of my life, that I'm just going to be so great at that one thing, you're missing out on what life is all about and figuring out, what life means to you and what happiness means to you. And, and, you know, get away from football. I mean, that, that to me is so key. Get away from football. If that's what you want to do, get away for a while, you know, get those juices flowing again and that excitement to get back to it when it's time to get back to it. Otherwise it's just work. It's just, oh, I got to go do it again. And eventually that catches up to you that I just think we have to be well-rounded and enjoy different things and enjoy your friends and be willing to go out and, and put the ball down and, and be involved with other things. Okay. God, that, that was amazing right there. High five. Off the cuff, too. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got seven kids, so none of it's off the cuff. They, uh, I've talked about those things numerous times. Okay, good. I, I want to, this is one, it's something I wrote down that I, I really wanted to ask you, and this is a perfect segue. What is the best piece of advice uh, from father to father? Because I got two kids, I got a four year old and a two year old. And what is a piece of advice you can give me just to be a, a great dad? Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, well, I mean, to be a uh, great, another big one, well, to, to be a great dad, to me, it's, it's always easy is, is to, to make sure your kids know you love them every day, that you're not perfect. You don't got all the answers and, and, you know, every lecture you give them or everything you try to do for them may not turn out to be the best thing in every situation. Um, but I just want my kids to know every day that I love them and that I support what the, whatever they do. So that's kind of my, my piece of advice as a parent. But I mean, I think there's just so many pieces of advice um, that you could give them, you know? And, you know, to me, one thing that I'm always trying to model, you know, more than even tell, is that whatever you do, be great at it. You know, be willing to, to be great at it and put in the time for it. Otherwise, I don't know if it's worth doing. So, you know, I don't have 20 different hobbies. I got a couple things that I do. And the reason is, is because I want to be good at it. I want to be the best husband I can be. I want to be the best parent I can be. 
want to be the best analyst now on TV, want to be the best player, um, you know, play basketball. That's my kind of my one hobby. I want to compete at a higher level and, and, and I want to stay in shape longer than everyone else. I want to beat everybody because I love to compete. But those are the things that I do because I want to be good at them. And I want my kids to do the same thing because I don't care if they dabble in a million different things to figure that out. But once they figure out what they want to do, just be great at it. Be willing to put in the time and the effort and, you know, want to learn and, and want to, you know, be good at it so they can separate themselves at whatever they're passionate about. Um, because that to me is what life's all about. If you can do what you're passionate about and be good at it uh, so you can do it for a long time, you're going to be one happy individual. And so that doesn't mean, you know, you have to, you know, have 75 things you're great at. Have a couple, you know, have a few, whatever you're, you know, whatever you're locked into. And those are kind of the things that, that I'm focused on. And so I try to be great at them and separate myself in all those different areas. Okay. That's great advice. And I wrote that down too, by the way. All right. Uh, just got a text from the wife. She's like, Hey, when are you going to help me with this? With yeah, yeah. two kids? So I got one more question. I saw this on Twitter, something different. You tweeted out, you're trying to find a good show that has redeemable characters. <laughs> yes. Have you found that show? Because I'm, I'm trying to find the same thing. The only thing I've seen, I've seen so far is the Jordan documentary. I'm locked in on that, but I didn't know yeah. if you found something. I have not found anything, but my wife is more of the, the TV watcher than I am. And so uh, she kind of pulls me into different things. And so the show I'm watching is not necessarily one with a bunch of redeemable qualities. It's actually the, the opposite. Everybody's got issues, but I'm hoping that eventually they, they come back around because that's what it's all about. Like, I don't need characters that have no depth and that they're always just goody two shoes. I just want characters that through their faults, find their way back to becoming something that is redeemable. And so actually right now we're watching Kingdom. Um, I've heard about like that. A, an MMA uh, show about it, like an MMA boxing spot. And so, um, but yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of junk right now in this. And so I'm, I'm waiting to see how it, we wade through it. But okay. again, you know, I mean, there's just, I like a lot of different things, you know, like I, I like to watch a lot of different things. And, and so I'm not stuck on one thing, but man, and you watch Ozark, uh, oh. holy cow. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> That, that was rough. I can't remember what the other one was that I was, I was Tiger, mentioning. Tiger King. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, <laughs> man, I mean, they lock you in, they make you feel better about yourself because you can't be quite that bad, but uh, there's just nothing that came out of that where I was feeling better, you know, about life in general. So, um, and again, Ozark's a great show. I mean, it's, it's intense, but um, it just kind of beat me up a little bit. So if you find one, let me know, or if anybody out there has got one, shoot me one, uh, shoot me an idea on, on Twitter. But, uh, but again, I like the kingdom. It's just, uh, it's not quite there yet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. All the coaches are in here and chat singing your praises. Uh, we, we thank you for, for coming on and talking. Oh about man, it. it was a blast. I love, uh, I love talking ball. So, uh, appreciate you reaching out to me and I appreciate everybody else uh, tuning in. All right. And coaches y'all have, y'all be safe. I just dropped my pen. Uh, and until next time, let's continue to master the spread, score points and have fun.